Hello guys, it's Peter from PS Sound and this video is the follow-up of this project. You could see the speaker installation, the Amprec fabrication before. You can check out the playlist to this project in the description as well. And in this one we are going to run through the power and the wiring in this build because this is certainly a crazy sound quality car just like we titled it. Um, okay, let's run from the front because, and then we go through this because every build has to get power from the alternator and from the front battery to get charge for everything else you do at the back. Some cars have the battery at the back and the factory charging cable runs to the back so that's that's an easy one. Uh, in this one the battery was right at the front. We built an E63 and a French one as well, another E-series in the past. Uh, you can find space behind the battery in these cars where there's a plastic plate where you can fit a gland and you can run the power cable through over that but the whole glove box and everything has to come out but it's doable you can run zero gauge through just like here actually the power up front was done by someone else by the owner back in Denmark but everything follows the Emma rules throughout the whole car so the main charging power cable running to the back has to be fused within 40 centimeter well that's obviously very short um, and the fuse holder has a valid bracket that was bolted bolted on so that's nice and solid and it has zero gauge with 250 amp uh, up to the maximum limitation of the cable so there's plenty of juice running to the back how much charge we actually get through smart charging who knows at the same time if you run a thicker cable from the front battery you also have to think about the ground you can't leave the factory ground which is only four gauge uh, if I can show it yeah that cable with the white paper on it that's only a four gauge cable and that's absolutely fine for the car's requirements but if you load the system with your audio system um, then you have to put the equal amount of uh, wiring on the ground just like on the power side so there's an extra zero gauge you can see that copper lug that runs over here to the factory ground point so the ground was also upgraded. Big free as such in this car is not required. This car is not pulling, you know, 250, 300 amp. On big base cars, big free would be required as well, where you upgrade the cable from the alternator as well as the ground. So everything is upgraded. I don't even know where the alternator is in this car, but it could be quite a nightmare, that's for sure. So from here, the power runs all the way to the back and then we will go through that as well but let's see what's happening here because this is certainly a complex system with many many amplifiers so we had a lithium battery in the previous project as well and in this one we wanted to have a new lithium battery so that's why some of you may find it now interesting why we have that battery back in the car as opposed to the Renogy what we used to have here I have to um, make sure that all of you understand that yeah there are different lithium batteries and I have to admit I even uh, ran into a bit of an issue with the energy we bought. I thought you know this system shouldn't draw more than 100, 150 amp and it certainly doesn't. Um, but that Renogy lithium battery wasn't holding the voltage well. It's not even impossible that the battery was slightly faulty and it was dropping voltage very quickly. And if you have to produce power, if you have lower voltage, you need more current. So when we powered the system on for the first time, um, I actually managed to push the battery into uh, shutdown. Some of the lithium batteries have a really strict BMS system, a battery monitoring system where that Renogy had 10 seconds doing maximum 115 amp and at 120 amp it, it literally like pulls the plug it cuts off it goes zero and the whole system just goes whoop um, and I was surprised after 20 seconds the battery comes back and everything is working fine but then I started to see what was happening and I put a clamp meter right on the main cable coming off the battery and I was measuring 75, 78 amp just for the front end uh, and all the components minus the sub. The sub wasn't even running. And I'm like, you know, if we run 75, almost 80 amp full tilt with the rest, then how do we have any headroom for the sub within 115 amp? 
and I was a bit shocked first uh, to see so much current draw from especially these tag amps because the rest uh, there's a digital lamp running the front sub and the rear components which is not much really and I only figured out that there was something wrong with that Renogy when we put the old U-Charge battery back which is a completely different lithium technology and it doesn't have such a, a low cutoff well it probably doesn't even have a cut cutoff because that battery was used by many base heads in UK and they were pulling 300 plus amps of those 130 amp power lithium batteries I just didn't want to keep it because it's been a used amp when we bought it three years ago and I just wanted to have a new battery and the lithium prices went down but we put this one back I turned up the whole system and we didn't see anything so high any any numbers that we saw before with the Renogy battery and we were having the sub running as well even with the sub we were seeing between 70 and 90 amp maximum on the whole system and the sub going full bananas full excursion crazy shit maybe with frequency with the sine tone yeah i could pull more with the sub but with music which is dynamic it was fluctuating between 70 and 90 ish but it never went above 100 so i'm like you know if with the sub running and this is a juicy sub running on two mono blocks um surely there was something wrong with that battery because this battery stays stable we are way above 12 volts i think the lowest i've seen was 12.3 12.4 on full tilt but when you listen to music on moderate high levels this battery doesn't go below 12.9 13 volt because it floats at 13.2 so this is just a little reminder for everyone to check out the specs of the batteries if they have a cutoff point and what that amp, amp is because um, yeah I fell into that and if I show you that Renogy right here yeah that Renogy battery yeah it's built in Bluetooth all those fancy things and this is another lithium battery a 75 amp hour lithium battery from a friend of mine from Europe and that for example has a maximum peak 200 amp and I think the shutdown is 280 amp on it so that's a better option actually with just 75 amp power than that if you have hive peaks yes if you don't have hive cur high current and you stay below 100 then you can play for many many hours and that will charge back very quickly but always check out if the battery has a cough then how does the charging work from the front to the lithium people always ask it do you run them parallel do you run it with a dc dc charger and when do you need a dc dc charger well I've been running my lithium in my Honda for several years just parallel with the front AGM but I've been fine because that car has smart charging but probably not as sensitive as uh, the latest cars these days my car is a 2006 it's a 2004 model um, with smart charging but not so sensitive if now let's say you flatten the lithium battery or both batteries if they are linked and if you turn the car on then your alternator is gonna sweat its pants and won't be able to cope with that current that it has to load for two batteries especially a lithium which has really low resistance and it would suck in all the juice also you have to keep in mind that lithium batteries don't like super high current charge uh, all of them have a limitation what they recommend like 50 70 amp maximum they could suck in to 300 amp as well but it's not great for them on on the long run when it comes to reliability so you if you don't have dc dc charger then just keep your eye on the voltage and if your overall voltage linked with an agm goes below 12.6 12.5 start the car charge it a bit till you go back up to 13 and you're good until you are not below the AGM's floating voltage most of the current will go out of the lithium anyway and then when you reach the floating of the AGM which is 5.7 usually 12.8 then both batteries will support the system with current and of course then you have more amp power if you are linked so it's not necessarily a bad thing to run it like that but in a new car where you have smart charging very sensitive system and you put extra load on it you may find problems because that's one of the reasons why some people don't understand why you have to go to the dealer and register your battery if you change the factory battery to something else because a different battery will have different specification different charging characteristics 
and the computer will see it and then we'll throw a message that hey ho I'm not happy so if you have a DC DC charger like we have that Renogy sorry not the Renogy we have the Victron in this one the Victron 30 amp um, isolator and DC DC charger then that only puts a maximum load of 30 amp on the car's uh, system so the car is not going to complain about that 30 amp is not much it's not much more than if you put all the consumers on in the car on which will draw way more than that if you put all the heated seats and things like that they will draw more than that so it's good to have that it keeps the lithium also safe it's not going to be charged with high current and it will be more reliable however that dc dc is an isolator once this one is charged up it cannot charge backwards or if you have a uh, external charger on the system like for a show it's not going to charge the front battery this one cannot do that it's literally um, like stinger has that isolator that split charge isolator it does the same thing so currently we are running an external charger and i wanted to show it to you because I haven't come across this. The owner got it fitted in Denmark and it's a beautiful little plug. What's the model on this? Difa. Difa. Is it a Danish thing or I don't know? No, I don't know. The guys, the guys can search for it. So this is a 230 plug and the car has a beautiful socket down here. There you go. So that's where the 230 goes in because the car has a charger built in hidden over there a CTEC 25 amp charger that runs into our main hub over there we have the fuse distribution so this battery on that run running to the charger is fused over there and that gives extra current to the system on a show Plus, if he wants to top up this battery, if it's not fully charged, he can always do that at home. Or if he wants to listen to music standstill for long. So the charger comes in here and then the power from the front also comes in from there to the input of the DC-DC charger. It needs a ground that obviously goes to the ground distribution and it has an output. That short link comes straight in to our main hub. So that's how we charge the lithium from this. Then from that same hub, we have three more outputs. Those three cables run over there, which run to two monoblocks, running the dual voice call crazy JR sub, because this is a dual, oh, come on, make it straight. So that's a dual 1.5 ohm um, sub. And that's quite a stupid core configuration because there are not many monoblocks that could be wired to 0.75 or if you wire them in series then you end up having 3 ohm and as music uh, will show you fluctuating impedance actually that's going to go up. Maybe 0.75 can run on, on many monoblocks but I thought you know what it's safer to run two separate uh, monoblocks for two coils. However, yes, we wanted the JL HD 1200, which would have been great because that gives constant power on 1, 2 or 4 ohm. 1200 watts would have been enough probably for this sub. Although most people said that no, this sub needs way more than that. <coughs> whether the sub needs it and whether we use it, that's a different story. But uh, at the end, we ended up having, and that's when I'm now going to tip the seats. Whoop. And then we can also lift this crazy thing and we will come back to it and I will show what's happening over there. But here, oh, let me tip the other side. There you go. All right. So the other three outputs from that main distro come here. So we have one monoblock on each side. Helix M1X and now yes people can say that oh these are very cheap for this build uh, I can't I can't sleep well thinking that I have cheap amplifiers here whereas you have very expensive stacks running the front end well um, we could have had many amplifiers and yes we had 
the Zepco Z400.2 as well, but the core, core configuration of that sub was just not making me happy when it comes to leaving enough headroom for this sub. So we also had to take into consideration the space, what we had. And I could see that, you know what, if we put that in the middle, that's an audio solution, power distribution and stabilizer that can do 150 amp continuous supply up to 14.8 or 15 volts, something like that. So we turn the system up to 14.4 volts, 14.3, and that keeps all the rest of the amplifiers on constant voltage, which is a beautiful thing for ultimate audio files. Um, and yes, when you see all this madness, why would we use these cheap monoblocks? And honestly, there's nothing wrong with those monoblocks. There's no high pass filter on them other than at 10 Hertz. So <laughs> that's low enough. It doesn't limit our frequency range with the sub. Then um, it doesn't have on pop, off pop, nothing. It's, it has plenty of clean power. And then using two of them now on the sub gives us so much headroom, so much clean power that the sub literally doesn't have a chance to have any distortion. We can push the sub to the absolute excursion limit and it always stays running with clean power because at like one and a half, two ohm, this has, you know, between 700 and 900 watts, double that, then that's what we have for the sub. It works beautifully. So from that power distro, we have, um, one four channel little stack I'm going to show inside of the rack. We had to change amplifiers here. I'm going to explain why. So we have one little four channel amplifier running the rear doors and the speakers up on the shelf. We have little speakers there in the roof each side. That's pretty much just for show or if we have rear passengers. Then we have a monoblock running the front sub. So that's two amps. Then we have big free uh, two master stroke class A on each side and an MSK 1500 running the mid base. So that's five amps, right? Yeah, five amps and DSP. So that's where we have all those six cable coming out. And on the left hand side of it over there, that's where the power comes into it from the main distro from our hub. Remote input from the DSP and then remote outputs to all the amplifiers. This power distro also has a data cable coming out of it, as you can see, that runs to a display that they supply this unit with. So you can see the voltage and everything. Actually, we are going to turn the system on and then you can see, see it all lit up. And if I'm here, I'm going to show this controller as well of the Zapco. There you go, system is going to come on. That's it. That's it. And we can always hide it. As simple as that. But now we have some crazy lights. There you go. We have to put the plexi panel back there because that's where you have the fuses for the outputs, the tiny little blade fuses, but you can double them up. So if someone worries about not having enough capacity for each output with the blade fuses, then you can double it up. So we have 40s in there doubled, so we have 80 amp on each output, which is perfectly enough for each amplifier. Yes, if you want to run big juicy monoblocks from this, I don't think it's the way to go because this has 150 amp peak anyway. No, 150 continuous, 300 amp peak. But as you have only one, four gauge coming in or you could have two gauge i think you can shove in two gauge into these um then yeah you would be good up to like 150 180 amp that that was the other reason why i didn't want to run the monoblocks from this because then we could have pushed this to the edge and i didn't want to do that i couldn't predict how much the overall current draw in the system would have been but as you can see everything has been ferrulled braided there's heat shrink on, on protecting the terminations and it's all labeled. And there you go, our horses next door are talking at the same time too, beautiful. Yeah, some people don't understand why we have these noises, but on the other side of our wall, uh, we have stables, <laughs> if, if this hasn't been obvious yet. So that's the 
main power distro for the rest of the amplifiers and then here we are with the madness inside there that's it let's tip it up further so here okay so as i told you we had a, a layout change because we had a zapco 150.6 some of you could see it from pictures or see it earlier we had to swap it out because this car had immense amount of noise and interference if you have a mercedes you will have to face it and if you have the hybrid pack then you will have to face that too these cars come with telematic system sos system and whatnot and you have so much uh high frequency madness running in here that they can throw immense amount of emf and the zapco ap 6 channel wasn't happy with that and it was making our life super difficult at the end after changing many cables many things we we had to swap them out uh was, well the ap amp out put these in and we still had to play with cables because even these stacks were picking noises up with our custom Chernoff cables these are differential cables so the shield is floating at the receiver end and connected to the source and yeah they were still picking up noise but we had three sets of stinger 9000 series and finally with those the system is now nice and quiet so over here on the dsp you can see what we are having because everything is labeled so the first pair is for the pair of tweeters then for the pair of mids and for the pair of mid base then we have a spare empty channel then we have rear doors rear shelves front sub and rear sub that's how we are using 14 channels for all this madness yeah this is not a simple system that's for sure i wouldn't advise it for beginners because there are many uh options for failure and yeah we had to face it as well we spent several days tracing issues which usually is no we never have issue with noise really when people ask me even on patreon that pete how do you deal with system noises and there's not much i can cover other than some cars can have alternator noise um if the ground points are weak or not done properly but if you do the wiring properly you don't have to have any noise issue um to deal with but in this car it was just mental some of the guys who are on patreon could follow it and if you want to see the everyday daily updates of this car then you can also check out the the link in description then you can you can see all the updates of this so now the system is on you can see we are floating on 13.4 with that lithium battery and we're sending out 14.3 14.4 for the audio solution distributor so it's a very stable system i was spending this spanking this system yesterday for many hours to the point that i managed to get the stag amps um running the fans and yeah the system was pulling like between 60 80 amp with full tilt music it's super stable everything is stable in the car we can run for hours and to be fair okay this system is not going to be played like that all the time but i always design everything in a way that it can it can take it nothing nothing is going to get destroyed nothing is going to struggle the front end could have an extra 6 db so we could quadruple the power easily on the front end but it's already screaming crazy loud and the sub could also take a bit more maybe if we play rebase crazy music then we reach the limitation of this jr sub with immense excursion um but yeah it's happy with it we had to do little extra little things like we had to 3d print this cover uh, if it wants to come off because according to rules we cannot leave any terminal um, exposed because then this could be shorted yeah someone walks around on the show and we're gonna pull a screwdriver out or something and then we're gonna short it right but there you go with this one now we are good 
on both sides there's one on that side too there's a quick connector for the sub so the sub can be lifted out with this mounting ring and the connection is gonna be safe because this sub has to be able to come out from here to get access to the battery pack that whole rack can also tip right from the bottom point and then tip up but for now for daily use is bolted it down on each side and one over there so it cannot tip right now but if it if it's needed it can tip and we also made this top section to get access to all of that with those struts yes we got the questions pete couldn't you have electric actuators blah 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 and of course we could but it's all time and it's the, that solution is not plug and play either you have to play with it you have to spend a lot of time with it and it can also fail this one doesn't fail once it comes down, we bolt it down, there's one point on each side and this rack is solid. It doesn't resonate, it doesn't vibrate, it doesn't have any noises. So that's the power side of this system. Hopefully I've run through everything. It's quite possible that I left something out because there are so many things in here. Actually on Patreon I was asking the guys to estimate how many terminations we had to do in this car. By termination I mean each cable ending whether it's signal speaker cable power cable control cable and i counted it up if i didn't make a mistake then we are at 190 190 terminations all to emma specs all braided all heat shrunk all labeled all that madness so yeah a wiring of a system like this can take probably two weeks work for a single person just put that into perspective when you plan something like this and we didn't even have to deal with running the speaker cables and the power cable in the car because that's already been done by the owner so yeah probably close to 80 hundred hours of work goes into wiring of a system like this yeah pretty pretty crazy let's talk about signal because that's also important so we have factory integration from the head unit. We have a most box from Mobridge, if I can show that, because that's sitting, oopsie, hang on. You can see a little black box down there. We have a most 150 integration box from Mobridge. And that takes the fiber optic line from the factory amp and gives us optical signal, so we can run that over there with the gray cable to the DSP input so that's one source for us from the factory head unit retaining all the controls volume so customer can have Android Auto um, and phone calls music everything for daily use we also have a coax line running there to the input so we have a wired coax connection to the middle where we can use a file M11 DAP that the owner has and we also have a little thing over there that lights up that's the HD Bluetooth module so we can stream from an iPad to watch videos or whatnot and we also have a USB oh, if I can show that because it's a bit dark yeah a little USB down there at the bottom because this DSP also has a HD player and we can play from a USB storage straight from the DSP which is a beautiful thing. So we have many digital inputs, four digital inputs. That cable there that's not organized, that's the USB for the laptop. I haven't unplugged it yet because I have to finish all the presets and then that will be unplugged. So that's the signal input side to the DSP. So then the DSP runs the system fully active and I may break it down just to be in a bit more detail. I know many of you who follow this channel uh, know what this game is about but some people don't so I have to explain what fully active means so in order to be able to control the response the time arrival and everything of each speaker to the listener we run every single speaker from an independent amplifier channel and every single amplifier channel gets its individual input from the DSP so with the laptop we can address and assign every single amplifier channel what signal we send to it we can 
have independent e equalization on each speaker. We can have time alignment and phase adjustment. So this way we can optimize the sound that the listener can hear, or we can create different presets for different scenarios, whether it's just competition um, requirements from a single position, or we have multiple listeners in the car. We have rear passengers, then the rear speakers from the rear doors and up here on the roof play very differently. So we can adjust all those things and we can have different presets that we can control from the display of the DS up, up front. And within a fraction of a second, we can change presets and the system is going to play quite differently. People always ask, why do we need different presets even if it's just about a single person's pleasure? And there's a constant argument about it in this car as well. There's a big difference between different settings whether it's competition requirement and a preset for that or for daily listening. You also have to keep in mind that uh, the environment is different. So that's the biggest factor. When you are judged, the car and the road noise is out of the equation and you have a quieter listening experience where you don't need that much rise below 200 or 300 hertz. And a preset like that on the road can lack bass. But when you have road noise, wind noise and all the rest, then you have to count for that and you need a different preset with more low end. So you need a preset for that. It's, it's a bit like having a sport car and we, you have different presets so you can um, change the performance and the, the car is going to drive very differently. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having different presets for a sound system. So yeah, this way from the output of the DSP, we run signal to each amplifier we came up to the rack, we separated the signal cables as well, they come up in between the amps and they run to each. So this way we separated pretty much everything. Signal is in the middle for those amps, speaker cable come up on the side. And then of course the power, then that runs all down at the other side. And from you could, you could see from the power uh, distributor and stabilizer. So, that's pretty much what we have in this car when it comes to power and signal. I just realized that I was talking again for 32 minutes without taking a breath or having a drink or anything. <laughs> uh, but hopefully I managed to cover everything for you guys. You can see how the wiring of this system came together. You can see something crazy. We do crazy builds and we also do simple builds. Uh, just like you could see a couple of cars like we shared recently, like that little uh, fixing job on on a system that was done by another shop so yeah these systems are truly magical they do things that your everyday daily cars won't do and some of these systems can actually perform better they can sound better than some high-end home systems these may sound like big words but honestly if you have the chance to pop down to us we are down in East Sussex in, in UK, uh, or if we have a meeting, if you follow PS Sound on Facebook, then we advertise the meetings. And you can come around, you can listen to many different setups, and you can hear it for yourself. These cars truly create magic. You have holographic imaging, staging right in front of you, and you have plenty of headroom to create live concert levels as well. So, yeah, this is a complex build though because this was designed for competition as well as for ultimate listening pleasure because the owner has pretty high reference level and standards, especially after his previous car that we built for him. I don't recommend to jump into a project like this without any experience or you have to trust us. You have to trust us and get ready for a big build as well because this is not a little toy, toy level. Um, but Certainly a car like this is a great platform for getting good sound because the car itself is also more rigid Although this car was soundproofed throughout everywhere floor roof all the did you do the doors? Yes, yeah, you did the doors you did everything yeah, because we didn't have to deal with that no, But that was how long did it say who did it actually? I didn't, don't even know a friend a friend of yours uh, Yeah But a friend of yours who has experience in yes, car yes, yes, yeah, so I can see that well. yeah, so how long did it take to do all the deadening wiring? Probably like two weeks. Yeah, five to six weekends. Oh, yeah, you add it up. 
Mm. It's quite a lot of time. Yeah, I would say, yeah, for us, it would take two weeks to do the full soundproofing job, all the wires running in uh, to competition standards. So a lot of work. So far, I have to count up, but what we did is in between 350 and 400 hours plus that. So to the time we have everything finished on this car and trim panels, this is going to be close to a 500 hour mega project, which is actually not that much because the insignia was 82 days at the end. But even with the unnecessary changes we had, still would have been at least 75 days. That is close to 600 hours. But I hear about systems in the USA which take 1000 plus hours. Uh, yeah, but the guys over there truly spend a lot of time when it comes to making beautiful panels and things like that. And that takes a lot of time. They build custom interiors. In this one, we didn't have to do that. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in the following video. So if you haven't seen the previous ones, check out the playlist. And if you want to see the following video when I'm going to run through the performance of the system, how we designed this system, uh, then, then please subscribe to the channel. Check out the description, as I mentioned, you have a link to Patreon where we share a lot of stuff. We share daily updates, weekly topics, RT evaluations, a lot of behind the scene deep stuff. Um, there's a lot to learn over there if you are one of those who want to learn or you are a proper car audio geek then it's worth to check out that channel as well. Other than that I'm going to leave it here. Feel free to share it, comment or do all the usual things and I will see you in the next one. Take care.